Welcome Mizzou fans to the weekly Tiger Club of Kansas City meeting for Tuesday, January 18th. We'll get to our guest here in just a moment, but first, if you're watching on YouTube, we'd love to have you join us live each Tuesday. So just click on kctigerclub.com and become a member and you too can join in and share questions with our guests. Um, while you're there, you can also click on the contact us button to get in touch with us on purchasing club tickets for men's and tickets and parking pass to men's and women's basketball games. So go to kctigerclub.com and feel free to, to reach out to us. Our guest today is indeed Gabe Bjarman, publisher of powermazoo.com. Gabe grew up in the Kansas City Northland, graduating from Park Hill High School before matriculating, as Hank Strand would say, down the road, down I-70 to Mizzou School of Journalism. He became a writer for the Rivals Network in 2003 before being named publisher of powermazoo.com, I believe in 2007. So his site is the place to click for the inside scoop on Mizzou football and basketball teams and recruiting. Gabe, sorry we don't have a Westport flea market burger for you today, but thanks for joining us via Zoom. Yeah, I thought maybe DoorDash would hit me up at like 11.58, but it didn't work out, so uh, we'll, we'll see. Maybe next time. The, the delivery charge was too high, so we, we, <laughs> we couldn't pull it off. Hey, we'll, we'll talk sports in a, in a, just shortly, but let's start with something that's uh, even more important. The um, Paramazoo Journalism Alumni Scholarship, you started a few years ago, was recently renamed. We'll get to that, but let's first start with the scholarship. Tell us about that, how it's going. I know you've raised over $60,000. Tell us about that a little bit. Yeah, it basically started two years ago as kind of a, a grassroots deal. I thought, hey, I know some Mizzou journalism people. Maybe I'd see if if a few of them would be interested in to chipping in a few bucks. And like my goal was, I don't know, maybe we can get a kid a thousand dollar scholarship for three or four years. Right. Um, and uh, through the efforts of uh, many people across the country, um, you know, Pat Forty was was instrumental in sharing it with a lot of people. Brian Nooner, who I worked for at KOMU and in, in, when I was in college, shared it with a number of people. And we've had a lot of people give a lot of money to it. It is up now over $60,000. It's endowed by the university, which means it's going to go on well beyond hopefully when I am, uh, you know, blogging every day about Missouri sports and uh, that money is reinvested every year, every May, they select a scholarship recipient. We had our, our first guy uh, last year, Joel Lorenzi was selected as the winner that winner interns for us for however long they are still around uh, Joel intern for us all, all first semester. And then actually was just uh, selected to the, uh, SJI, it's a, a journalism program, and he is going to be spending this semester in Indianapolis working at the newspaper there, and then we'll have an internship in Houston this summer. So, um, you know, if, if we played some small part in that, then uh, that's great. We, we hope to launch people on to much more uh, successful and notable careers than uh, working at Power Mizzou. Absolutely. You paid a, played a big part in that for Joel. Um, it, you, you mentioned that over 60,000. I, I meant to have the, uh, I, I think Mizzou give direct .missouri .edu. You can see that information and you can see the donor wall, which is a who's who of the Mizzou mafia that I, I know you've got to be really proud of, of that. There's some really big donors. And then recently you renamed it the uh, Therese Taylor uh, scholarship or the uh, fund. And tell us about that and the participation of his fiance, Ebony Reed. Yeah. So I think all your, your people probably know, I know Therese spoke a few times at the club and uh, we're coming up just on a year now. Cause I remember it was, it was about a week after the Super Bowl last year uh, that Therese died and um, you know, it, everybody who got to know him, it, it hit a lot of us pretty hard. And, so it occurred to me, hey, this was something that Therese was passionate about, was, was giving minority people kind of a, a chance to, to launch into the career that he did and was so successful at. And so I reached out to his fiance, Ebony Reed, and just said, hey, here's what I want to do. But I want to, I, I mean, I want to make sure it's okay with you. Like, I don't want this to seem like we are capitalizing on Therese's name at all, because that's the last thing we would have wanted to do. And uh, she thought about it and talked to her family um, and, and was on board with that and has, has really helped out, 
and uh, spread the word. And, and I know she gets notes from Mizzou every time somebody donates to her. And, and she and I have, have gotten to talk quite a bit over the last year. And um, also want to make sure to, to mention, too, that there is a scholarship at Howard University in Therese's name um, that in our main thing in, in renaming it for him was we don't want to divert any attention away from that. We, you know, uh, if you want to do something for Therese, please go, go to Howard university and do that. Um, uh, you can also buy the, the all juice t-shirts and sweatshirts. I hope you guys have some, I have a hoodie. It's, I wear it seriously. Like every day, I, I sometimes I take it off to do laundry, but it's the most comfortable shirt I own. So, um, you know, just, just kind of a little way to, to remember our friend and, and a guy that, uh, I mean, he was, he was phenomenal. And, uh, you know, every time I watch a chiefs game, I, I still kind of think, man, I wonder what Therese would, would write about this one. Uh, very good work, Gabe, and you should be very proud of that. Um, and some heartbreaking news yesterday uh, off the field news. Mizzou pitching coach Brian DeLunas lost his uh, battle to kidney disease. Uh, he had jobs with uh, numerous major league clubs, and he uh, also had a pitching school, uh, pitching classes in St. Louis. And before all of that, he had served as a volunteer assistant at Mizzou when uh, Max Scherzer was a Tiger um, and he had now returned back to Mizzou in a full-time capacity. He seemed like a great guy. I know you had posted about it yesterday. Had, had you had an opportunity uh, to interact with Brian? I actually didn't know Brian, um, but there have been a few people on our board since that news came out that said, man, I worked with him when I was in high school and, and he did a lot for me as a baseball player and, and a guy and all that. And, uh, you know, I got call yesterday hey we're about to put out a release at 245 and i'm like okay what what happened now you know that's not really the what you expected to follow i i don't think it's uh i've learned a little bit more about the story i don't think it's really shocking to a lot of people other than hey he was 46 years old so that is shocking but he's been uh he's he's had a kidney disease for a long time now he had had one transplant needed another one and and i think just didn't wasn't able to get that before uh before it beat him so that does seem like a really it is a really touching story and, and a really good guy so check out powermazoo.com and see what some some folks who did interact with brian had to say uh gabe let's turn to the court where just over a week ago the men's team pulled off an upset of 15th ranked alabama so uh since then the tigers have uh, fallen to seven and nine on the season but we're, we're the booster club here. We're the Kansas City Tiger Club. So, so let's look at the bright side. What can we take from that Bama win as we continue into SEC conference play? Yeah, way to way to butter them up, Darren, with the with the good stuff first. Um, I mean, I guess you can take that the next time they were on the floor, they were behind thirty-one to five or something like that. So apparently, whatever happened against Alabama doesn't seem super sustainable. Um, but you know, like basketball is, we look for all these reasons and we break it down, right? When the ball goes in, you're a good team. And sometimes the ball goes in, even for teams that don't shoot it well. And, and sometimes for teams that do shoot it well, the, the ball just doesn't go in on that particular day. So I, that kind of happened against Alabama, Missouri. You know, there was a lot of griping then uh, during the Arkansas game, which was four days later. Well, Conzo doesn't know how to coach offense. Well, like four days ago, that was one of the elite offensive performances in the history of Missouri basketball. Right. So guess what the difference was the ball went in, you know, and um, that is not an overall defense that saying he should be the coach in perpetuity or any of that, but uh, there are going to be days where it, it looks okay. And it, it did against Alabama and kind of uh, like I wrote after that, Hey, wins are probably not going to be super frequent this year. So enjoy the ones that you get. On the women's side, uh, the, the Tigers are facing the gauntlet that is the SEC conference schedule right now. They did fall last night at home to number 13, Georgia, but you've had high praise for uh, Robin Pinson's team this, this season. Yeah, they've done well this year. I mean, uh, you know, their first, their first loss was to number two, Baylor, um, and, and then they beat number one, South Carolina, and it's those things will build up a lot of equity to allow you to survive things like losing three straight SEC games, right? I mean, there is Missouri's lost three in a row. Um, solid teams, but I mean, Georgia's a really good team, but Arkansas is solid, but not great. And I, I can't remember there was, there was one more loss in there. I think it was LSU on the road. So 
not embarrassing losses by any stretch of the imagination. They're playing good teams, but if you come into the non-con, come into the conference season sitting like eight and five, you know, then you lose three in a row and then people are kind of howling, but they built up some equity in the non-conference season. They gave themselves a little margin for error. The SEC is good enough that, you know, if you finish 500 or, or pretty close to it, you're probably getting in the tournament. So they've got, you know, I guess, what would it be? 13, 14 games left, something like that. If they can split the rest of those games, they're probably going to be a tournament team, which would, would certainly be progress and, and a significant achievement. Um, but they, they are going to have to win some of them, right? I mean, it, it, hey, they played – last night was, was tight. They came back. They forced LSU to overtime, all that. But, um, you know, you, you do have to put some of those on the left side of the column in, in order to get where you want to get at the end of this year because I think certainly um, at some point in the last two or three weeks, this became a season where you need to make the tournament now. Um, anything short of that will, will definitely be disappointing. I want to remind our viewers on our live – uh, Zoom cast today to if you have a question for Gabe, please feel free to put it in the chat and we will make sure that that question gets asked of Gabe. Um, turning to football, Gabe, uh, Eli Drinkwitz team finished the season just under a month ago in the Armed Forces Bowl in Fort Worth. What did you take away from that game? Perhaps the performance of starting quarterback Brady Cook, maybe the future of the Tigers. I think we'll talk more maybe about recruiting and quarterback and transfer, but what, what'd you take away from that game uh, watching Brady cook quarterback, the Tigers? Well, I took away that maybe a lot of the people that were saying for the last month of the season, yo, we're playing the wrong guy might've been right. Um, now I don't want to look, there were some hiccups there um, and it was army. It wasn't it, Florida or Georgia, right? So you don't want to be, too reactionary off of one game, but he looked pretty good. Uh, he's, he's athletic, you know, he can run. Um, the moment didn't seem too big for him or anything. He made a couple mistakes, uh, but it does kind of make you wonder a little bit more what, what was going on those last four weeks. Cause it really did hit a point where I said a number of places kind of felt like Drinkwitz was doing Connor Basil like a disservice by continuing to, to put him out there at what certainly seemed to all of us watching far less than full health, you know, and, and the, the idea that Basilak was the guy that gave them the best chance to win the last four games of the regular season, then suddenly didn't give them the best chance to win the bowl game seems kind of odd to me, but the coach says what he says. And, you know, uh, you don't accuse someone of not telling the truth without, without any proof, they're not telling the truth. Right. Um, so quarterback's going to be interesting. Just, I mean, I wrote, I think it was the Vanderbilt game when Basilak got hurt. And I wrote literally that night, the way Eli Drinkwitz handles quarterback the next year or so is going to determine whether he's successful at Missouri, because you knew somebody was transferring after this year. Now, at the time I wrote that, I thought it was probably going to be Brady Cook. It turned out it was Basilak. Either way, you got Cook and Macon on campus for spring football, and I think it was very important that he managed to keep two of those three around, right? I, which two didn't really matter to me, but they had to have two of those guys back. They do for spring ball. You would assume those guys will both be back for fall camp when Sam Horn is here, but the truth of the matter is somebody's probably transferring after next year too. Whether that's Cook or, or Macon would, would seem more likely just because, but somebody's going to figure out next year, hey, I'm the third string guy here and I'm probably not playing. And that guy's probably going to leave. That's what recruiting quarterbacks is in this day and age. So um, I think, you know, it'll, it'll be interesting to follow. And the bottom line is he has to get it right because that's what gets most coaches fired, right? If you, if you don't get it right at quarterback, it's, it's pretty hard to win. Uh, only other thing I took away from the bowl game is that, I think coaches and schools got to quit telling fans how important it is that they go and that these games matter because they just kind of quite obviously don't with the number of kids that aren't playing in them and the number of, I mean, Missouri's best player was basically advised not to play in it by the coach. So, you know, I, I think the days of pressuring fans to buy bowl tickets and make these trips to places around Christmas uh, need to end from athletic departments. You know, Gabe, I was at the Mizzou game in Athens um, I really like the way both quarterbacks played, you know, and, and the final score to me didn't feel like a, as bad as it was. And, and I saw good things out of, out of Tyler. I saw good things out of Brady. It, it, it kind of made me wonder um, just like, 
you know, Chase Daniel at, at the Iowa State game in 2005, I think it was, you know, he had played at least a series every game. When he got into that moment, he really played well. So Brady did get to play, but maybe if he had played a, a series or two in other games, maybe the bowl outcome would have been a little bit different. Could have been. Um, also, maybe if he got to hand the ball off to Tyler Beatty, the bowl outcome would have been a little bit different, right? That's going to help any quarterback. Um, I And look, you never want to say the result of the game was immaterial. But again, when, when there are guys just not playing and the coach is, is telling some of them they probably shouldn't play, I've, I've got a hard time really judging, hey, you lost on a last second field goal or, or you won because that field goal missed. I, I don't know that there's much difference in those two things. So let's talk a little bit more about the quarterback position and spring ball. You, you brought it up a little bit. Do the, do, do you foresee the Tigers picking up a transfer there? Are they going with the incumbent? Is Cook the, the starter, the incumbent? We've got Tyler Macon, again, who I, I thought played well in some aspects at, at Georgia. Is it the incoming freshman, Sam Horn? I know he won't be there in the, in the spring, but what are kind of your – thoughts I, I know it's unknown right now but what are your kind of your thoughts as we in spring ball yeah I mean spring ball is the chance for Macon and Cook to create to make an impression and create some separation and convince the coaching staff I should be your guy going into August right um because Sam Horn's not going to be here yet and so they're competing against each other basically to prove hey I'm the guy that should start next season this is based on zero inside information, but the way things have gone the last few weeks of the season, I looked at it and I said, it sure looks to me like Drinkwitz is setting this thing up for Sam Horn to get every shot to start next year. Um, now, again, what you do in, in spring ball, what you do in fall camp can change that. I, by, I don't want anybody to hear this and say, well, he's writing off Cook and Macon. No, I mean, those guys, hey, if those guys come out and play better and one of them's a I mean, shoot, if Tommy Locke's the best quarterback on the roster, cool, play him. I don't care who it is. It doesn't matter. But um, I, I'm not at all going to be surprised if Sam Horn is the starter at some point next year. And I'm not sure I'll be that surprised if he's the starter game one. What about a transfer? Do you think a transfer's in the making it, if they get the right guy? Or do you think we're not really looking for one? What, what are your thoughts on a, on a possible, maybe even, you know, a, a one, one year and done guy? What, what's your thoughts there? Well, first of all, if you're going to take a transfer, it has to be a guy that's only going to be here one year. You can't take somebody who's going to be here two and three years because as soon as you do that, Brady Cook and Tyler Macon, they're going, well, cool, I'm out. Like they just, they just gave my job to somebody else. So they're going to transfer and Sam Horn's going to look at it and say, hold on, man, this isn't the deal I signed up for. So if you were going to bring in a guy, I could see it being a grad transfer or a guy that hits the portal that you don't expect that he's, Hey, he may not be a graduating senior, but he's probably going pro next year. I don't know that that guy's out there. I mean, there was about a 24 hour flirtation with Spencer Rattler where it looked like that was possible. That didn't happen. Um, they haven't really, to my knowledge, pursued anybody else in the portal. Um, now there'll be another wave after spring football. I know, you know, Missouri fans are all a, a Twitter right now. The fact that JT Daniels just entered the portal from Georgia and I don't know if we get some indication Missouri goes after him, certainly we'll report on it, but, it's not really my expectation. And, and I think the mistake that people are making, and I made this analogy the other day, people are treating the portal like monopoly money, right? Like, oh, hey, we've got these things. Let's just grab as many of them as we can. And let's put four houses on the purple properties and four more on the orange properties. And then let's go buy all the railroads. Let's, let's get it all. These are human beings you're dealing with. You have a locker room dynamic that you have to manage. And if you bring in a, a transfer at the most important position on the field, there are going to be consequences of that in your locker room. And you have to, head coaches have to weigh all that. It's very easy for all of us to just sit back and go, well, I don't know, that guy has five stars and that guy has four. And so go get him and go buy him and do all that. But you've got to actually build a locker room too. We're talking with Gabe DeArmond, powermazoo.com publisher. If you have a question for Gabe, you're listening in the live Zoom, please feel free to add it to the chat. Uh, Gabe, speaking of uh, transfers, the Tigers picked up a commitment from a 
defensive end, I think we're calling him this weekend. Um, where do you think the Tigers turn anywhere else in the portal? I know you've mentioned it's not, it's not monopoly money, but are we, are we looking for a linebacker, tight end, defensive back, defensive lineman? What are, what are your thoughts on any more pickups in the portal? Well, by the time anybody other than the people on this live see this, I think Missouri will have a uh, transfer running back in the fold. Um, honestly, could happen while we're on the call. Nate Pete, a Rockbridge kid, transferring from Stanford. We fully anticipate that he is going to announce at some point in the next 24 hours that he is, uh, is transferring to Missouri. He is in the Missouri student database. Uh, so, you know, classes started today. That's pretty, pretty telling to us. Um, I think they'll still take a linebacker. Um, I think they almost have to take a tight end because they've lost all three that played. Ryan Horstcamp, who played somewhere around 100 snaps, I think is, is the only guy that's seen the field outside of walk-ons um, on the roster. So I think you got to go a tight end and probably a linebacker. They could always add somebody else, right? Like I said, there's going to be another wave of, of kids entering the portal after spring football, and if there's room, they could always go somewhere else. But those are the two well, positions there's I'm NIL, looking at, just, um, the oops, kids that – Name, you, uh, image, and like – Hang on, I got somebody uh, talking here in a car. So um, it, was our, it was our friend Paul. So. Okay. <laughs> um, but the, the kid who, who signed yesterday um, – named Tyron, Tyrone Hopper from North Carolina. It's my favorite recruiting story I think that's happened. He committed to North Carolina in the summer of 2015 before Gary Pinkle had coached his last game at Missouri. Since then, Gary Pinkle coached a year and retired. Barry Odom coached four and got fired. And Eli Drinkwitz has coached two. And he's now going to play his seventh college season at Mizzou. And people say, well, how? Well, he redshirted his first year. He played... I guess he registered in 16, played 17, 18, 19, was going to be a senior in 2020, but then that didn't count for anybody. Everybody, that was just free years. Speaking of Monopoly money, everybody come back. It's cool. Won't screw up anything in college sports at all. And then 2021, he got hurt in the first game of the season. And so got some sort of a waiver that, hey, you can have another year to replace this year that was replacing the year that didn't count. And so he will, uh, he will be lining up for his seventh season as – what I believe will be a rotational edge rusher because I don't see him, you know, starting over, uh, over Tyron or Trajan Jeffcoat or Isaiah McGuire next year. You mentioned jump off to, to Gary Pickle for just a second. His uh, induction in the Hall of Fame really brings back memories of just how special the Pinkle era was at Mizzou and really had unprecedented or whatever you want to say. Yeah. It was a very special time at Mizzou for the Hall of Fame coach. So I went back and looked. Um, since 1971, which was the first post Dan Devine season, Gary Pinkle was 45 games over 500 at Missouri. He was 118 and 73. Every other coach they've had is a combined 36 games under 500. So Missouri is a approximately a five and six football program for the last 50 years, except when Gary Pinkle was the coach. And I think a lot of people understood how good Gary was when he was here. I think a lot more people understand it eight years later because the truth is, and, and, and I don't look, I didn't see Dan Devine coach. I certainly didn't see Don Farrow coach. I, whether he is better, or worse, or the same as those guys, I have no idea, but that's the, that's the, that's the entire roll call for best coach in Missouri football history. And he's the only one that's done it in the last 50 years, you know, so uh, nobody else has, has had his success and, and matched what he's done. And, uh, I know Gary would, would love to, you know, Gary and Norm are, are very similar in that it's unfortunate for their legacies that they didn't win that one more game at the right time. Because I think nationally, and I think even in this fan base, everybody looks at Gary differently if he's one in three in conference championship games, or if Lou Perkins doesn't swindle the Orange Bowl into inviting Kansas instead of Missouri, I, I think Norm has looked at completely differently if he wins just one of those. I think he went to three elite eights. If he wins one of those games, he's looked at completely differently. It's kind of dumb. It's kind of arbitrary. It's not really fair, but that's what it is. Um, but I, the, the way I put it in, in what I wrote is every coach who coaches here after 2015, the standard now is be as good as Gary Pinkle was. And I'm not going to say it's never going to happen. Because never's a long time, right? But it's a pretty high bar. 
and as good as he was and, and coaching up players as well, it, um, no question about it. He, he's in the hall of fame, but the recruiting now, and you've been highly complimentary of, of uh, coach drink with staff and even say, I mean, it, it's the, the recruiting is something that I think you have even said you never thought was even possible at Missouri that, that what's yeah. happening right now with recruiting. Well, and the funny thing is kind of to tie it back to Pinkle, like, there's a lot of people that go, man, Gary was a great coach, but he couldn't recruit. Well, no, apparently he could because Sean Weatherspoon was a really good player. And I don't care how many stars he had, right? Brad Smith was a phenomenal college football player. And Gary deserves credit for seeing something in some of those kids that nobody else saw. But that doesn't mean he didn't recruit well. Good coaches have good players. And he had good players. Um, so Eli Drinkwitz recru recruits well in December and February. Now, does that mean that these guys will be good players? Look, we have seen, I mean, Missouri fans have told me for 17 years on this job, well, you say stars, stars matter, but they don't matter. Look at Nebraska and look at Tennessee and look at Texas A&M, all these places, they don't matter. Well, now Missouri's getting some stars and now all of a sudden stars matter, right? <laughs> so, I mean, and I think overall they do, but I've always said NFL GMs miss on half the guys they, they draft. I don't know why people think rivals should be more accurate than that. You know, I mean, we're going to miss on a lot of guys. Um, now, you don't have to be a genius to watch Luther Burden play high school football and think, you know what? I think that kid's going to be pretty good. Uh, that's, that's pretty easy to do. Um, but you do have to be pretty good at what you do to watch Tyler Beatty play football and say, hey, I think that kid's a kid that can play here and, and be good because nobody else saw that. So, um, I part of what I really don't like about what we do is that it just sets up expectations for these kids that aren't fair. I mean, if you look at Blaine Gabbert, most college quarterbacks would be really happy to have had Blaine Gabbert's college career and NFL career, honestly. I mean, no, he never became a, a, a great starting quarterback, but like he'd been around for a while. He's got a ring. He's made a lot of money. He's done pretty well. Most kids if you tell them that's what you're going to be coming out senior year of high school they're going to be pretty happy with that and I think Missouri fans look at it and say eh, feels like it should have been more that's that's really unfair to blame you know so um yeah but yeah Eli is on paper hey he's done things that have never been done here before that I didn't think could be done here and now starting in September that has to translate into on-field results They've they've done really well, obviously in St. Louis, uh, mm -hmm. and what we picked up there. But also at Kansas City, they were doing really well, and, and we really got to enjoy KC Woods up here in the KC area. I know there's talk about the importance of a recruiting coordinator, but boots on the ground, KC Woods in Kansas City was doing a real really good job. So um, uh, Mark asked in the chat, what what do you take from the changes to the football coaching staff? I know the, a couple were announced today with a. Jacob Peeler and, and new new position for uh, Bush Hamden. So what are your thoughts on the coaching changes? We we weren't used to that under, right. you know, that's another thing, bring Gary Pinkle back in. We weren't used to that then. Now, now is it is it okay with the turnover? Yeah. What are your thoughts? I mean, Eli has hired more coaches at Missouri than Gary did, which is, it says, I think more about Pinkle than it does about Eli, right? Uh, this kind of is college football. I mean, if you remember uh, the, the one I always point to, Barry Odom hired a cornerbacks coach named Greg Brown. He was here for a year. If you looked at Greg Brown's resume, he had something like 19 jobs in 24 years. Sometimes he would go back to a place down the road, but he never stayed at a place. These guys are migrants. They are mercenaries. They go where the check is. Also, a lot of times if a team underachieves, it's way easier to fire the linebackers coach or to tell the linebackers coach, ah, you might want to go find another job than it is anything else. You know, and Eli's numbers are inflated because he kept Barry Odom's defensive staff in place in year one. But I think we all knew that wasn't really his long-term plan. He was never really invested in those guys. So Brick Haley's gone. Ryan Walters is gone. I think there's one other one in there that, that I'm missing that, that also departed. Um, and so that inflates the numbers. Um, but I don't want to totally gloss over the idea. I mean, most of these guys have left for better jobs, right? Now, the one that raised my eyebrows a little bit was Aaron Fletcher leaving for Arizona State. Um, it's not geographically any more sensible than where he was. He's mostly, a, he's an Oklahoma and Texas guy. So Arizona is certainly not any closer than, than Missouri was. Um, I, 
maybe Drinkwitz encouraged him to look elsewhere. If he did, that to me indicates he made a mistake hiring him because it was only one year. It, could there be, hey, this guy's hard to work for? Sure, there could be. I, I mean, I don't, I don't want to gloss over that and say that that is impossible, right? I don't know what to make of all the changes. Um, I don't think you automatically assume there's nothing to worry about, but I also don't think you can automatically assume that, hey, it's, it's time to ring the alarms and, and, and we got problems here. I mean, go win games. I, I mean, truthfully, how many people do you think that aren't on this call or belong to my site could have told you the name of Missouri's cornerbacks coach next year? If, if you're averaging 45,000 fans at Faroe Field, I'm going to bet a minimum of 80% of those. If you said who's Missouri's cornerbacks coach, they would say, wait, they got a guy that only coaches those two players. I didn't even know that was a thing. Uh, Patrick asked in the chat, other than the transfer from OSU, do you see any transfers making an immediate impact uh, on the team next year? Well, I mean, I think Tyrone Hopper has to, I mean, he's a seventh year guy, right? You didn't bring him in to, to not play. Um, so it, if he doesn't make an immediate impact, I, I think then probably you've, you've kind of missed there. If they, uh, if they get Nate Pete, I think you're looking at, Hey, he's got more college rushing yards than anybody on the roster. I think he's a guy that plug and play, whether he's the starter every down back or, or not, but I think he plays, um, and, you know, uh, Vince Polgar, the, the kid from Buffalo, is going to have every shot, I think, to be the starting center. Now, I think we'll probably get to the end of the year, and most of us won't know whether the center was an impact guy or not necessarily, but I think he'll play. Um, so for the most part, I think when you're recruiting transfers, there it's basically the new junior college player, right? You don't go out and get JUCO guys to sit. And Drinkwood said that a couple of years ago when they brought in Realist George and Ben Key. He said, look, we didn't bring them here to not play. I mean, they're supposed to play day one and that's what transfers are now. You're not recruiting transfers with the idea that, Hey, come here and, and sit for a couple of years. And maybe when you're a senior, it's going to work. No, if, if you're taking a transfer, the idea is he's good enough to help us be a better team next year. Speaking with Gabe Yarman of paramazoo.com. Feel free to add your question in the chat. Gabe, let's ask a couple questions away from uh, football and basketball. Um, I really enjoyed the Boulevard Brewing post-game drink uh, mm -hmm. this year and listen to that. Sometimes on my way back to Kansas City, listen to it in the car. Um, any innovations for next year? How'd that go? Looks like you're going to do it again and maybe expand. So so how'd that go? Yeah, it's it's been kind of fun. It's given me a different um, avenue after games. Rather than pounding away at my keyboard, I get to listen to people who may or may not have had a couple cocktails uh, call in and air their frustrations. So it's kind of fun. I never have to leave my house. The Armed Forces Bowl was actually the first Missouri football game I was at in person in two years. So um, that was interesting. Uh, but yeah, one of the the big things we're doing this year. Um, so with the, with the advent of the name, image, and likeness stuff, we've got some new avenues open to us. And uh, starting, I guess, two weeks from today, um, our first episode will air. We're, we're going to do a weekly show for 10 weeks with Mookie Cooper. It'll basically be kind of like this, just a conversation between me and Mookie. Um, but it's, it's really a chance for him to kind of get his story out there. And the way I'm pitching these, and, and we're hoping to maybe do more than just Mookie, uh, hoping to maybe be able to announce something else here in the next couple of weeks, but uh, is players are easier to root for when you know them, right? They're not just these robots and chess pieces that move around on a football field. You know their stories. I mean, I, I think all of the people on this call, and I will include myself in that, like you got to know T. Rucker and Tommy Saunders and some of these guys that played on those teams, Chase Kaufman. And, you know, I know some of those guys are, are guests at, at some of your guys' meetings. I still keep in touch with some of those guys, and it's, it's 15 years after they played because the relationship was so much different. Access was better, and, and you got to know them. And so that's what I'm hoping to do with this show, just to give a kid kind of a chance. I mean, we're going to talk some football. But, you know, I promised him, look, I'm not going to bring you on here and say, tell me who the starting quarterback is going to be, because I'll get in as much trouble for that as he will. So that's not the goal. The goal is, hey, tell me about growing up in St. Louis and your relationship with your mom. And then tell me about the year you spent at Ohio State. And, you know, what 
Wait, what went on there and why'd you, why'd you decide that was the place you should go? And then why'd you decide that wasn't the place you should go, you know? And so just give everybody a chance, uh, through this Avenue that, that has kind of been made available now to, uh, to have a little more access to the team than they normally have. And further for name image likeness on, uh, it's effect on Mizzou. It seemed like that played a part maybe with our, uh, <laughs> picking up, uh, Luther and, and St. Louis, yes. um, so what gives takes away. We don't really think uh, a transfer out, recent freshman transfer out was necessarily NIL. I don't think it, it, that may have had something to do with a high school coach. But do you think, I know your ideas, uh, your thoughts have evolved on NIL. Is it, is it going to hurt Mizzou or help Mizzou? Or is it going to be just the same? The, the, the big guys are going to do okay, they're going to figure out a way to do okay, and Mizzou's going to do okay, or big guys are going to do great, Big Mizzou's going to figure it's going to be okay. What, what are your thoughts now as they've evolved over time? Yeah, I mean, one of the big arguments I see is, well, now Alabama and Ohio State and Texas A&M are going to get all the players. Well, Alabama and Ohio State and Texas A&M already get all the players, so what are we changing here, right? Um, uh, it, we're just making things that have been illegal now legal, um, and so – I do think it's not going to be a sea change. Missouri is not going to sign eight five stars next year, right? But it did play a part in why Luther Burden play, is playing here. And I hate to tell you, it played a big part. You know, I mean, without it, I don't know that he's at Missouri. And I know that disappoints people who want to think that, well, you know, that Ole Mizzou should be as important to Luther Burden as maybe it is to, to a lot of people listening to this. But Luther Burden is going to college to play football and make his situation better and his family situation better. Uh, and if he can do that at Missouri or Georgia or South Carolina, or, you know, the university of Ontario, whatever it is, that's what he's going to do. And so I think this opens up an Avenue to get a little bit of uh, the elite for some of the schools that haven't always gotten it. I looked uh, three of our top five players in the country signed this year with with schools that you would not consider elite recruiting schools. Missouri got burden. Number three player in the country is going to North Carolina. And the number one player in the country is obviously going to Jackson state. That probably doesn't happen three years ago. Well, I know it doesn't happen three years ago because I look back over the previous four years and it had never happened. Zero top five players had gone anywhere other than the 12 schools you would go. Oh yeah. Well, that's a, that's a top 12 recruiting school this year. It did happen. So I, I'm not saying it's going to, turn the tide for Missouri um, and, and they're not going to get everyone, but it does give them a shot to get one like Luther burden. And then if you could maybe get one more like Luther burden next year, all of a sudden you got two and then maybe you can build on that and win more games. And then maybe you get another one who it's not NIL. It's just, Hey, all of a sudden you got a pretty good team, you know? So, and, and kind of like Drinkwitz has said, I, you can like it or hate it. You can be angry and you can think it's going to be, the death for Missouri, but it's here. So you can either make the best of it or you can kick and scream and watch everybody else pass you up. And so I, I don't think there's much choice. You just make the best of it. We don't think that uh, the, the Wingo transfer was necessarily NIL related. You know, we had the, his, his high school coach being there uh, probably had everything to do with that, but it did seem like a surprise though. You know, it, it's yeah. everything. You, you may not be surprised at a Sean Robinson, although I hated that one or a, even a quarterback transferring out, but, but we're trying to get, we're, we're trying to close the borders. We get one. It seemed like a surprise. And then he had some interesting comments. Uh, Mark says in the interview with KS uh, DK about culture and accountability. Yeah. What, what, what do you make out of that? Well, I mean, first of all, kids say a lot of things, right? I, for years, people will read these recruiting interviews about why a kid chose Ohio State over Missouri or Oklahoma over Missouri. Well, we got to change this. Maybe the kid was just looking for a reason not to be here, right? I, I mean, you can't take what a, an 18, 19-year-old kid says in the press as, as the gospel truth. Um, the Wingo thing it certainly surprised me. Um, I know certainly disappointing and upsetting to – people at Missouri and I'm not just talking fans here, but you also, I mean, look, they hired his high school coach a week before it was obvious. We knew what was happening. Um, and he announced it on, on Tuesday afternoon that he's going to LSU surprise. No one. 
Um, I think it's good that the kids do have the opportunity to transfer without sitting out because like if you signed with the, it, like Caleb Williams signs with Oklahoma and then his coach bolts for USC. Well, why shouldn't Caleb Williams be allowed to, to then say, oh, well, this ain't what I signed up for. I'm going to go somewhere else. And, and the thing about the portal is this, uh, I think two, one about fans and one about coaches. So the week before Makai Wingo left, Missouri got Jaden Jernigan, a kid who played a lot of snaps on a top 10 team. And if you are not a Missouri fan, you're looking at that and going, eh, kind of seems like he's leaving for a worse situation. That's weird, right? So you can't say, way to go, Eli, love the transfer portal over that, and then say college football is broken when, when Makai Wingo leaves. I, I mean, you, you can either accept them both or hate them both, whatever, but they're both uh, facts. And, you know, I know a lot of coaches will privately and probably some publicly complain about this transfer, transfer portal thing and say, you know, well, it was uh, back in my day, kids stuck it out. They worked hard and they, they, they earned what they got and all that. And, and that all sounds great. Right. But okay. So then if you're angry about it, then don't take transfer. Don't take these kids from other schools that have given up on the other school. Right. Or, and don't tell a kid who's been here for two years, probably not going to play. You should probably look somewhere else. So you can't hate the portal, but then run your pro use the portal to better your program. Um, I, again, I, I'm not telling anybody how to feel about it. I understand people that I overall think it's bad for college football. I do. I, I think this, and I think name image and likeness as it currently stands without any regulation. I think those are both overall bad things for college football, but they exist. And I, I'm just against hypocrisy, right? I, I don't want the, well, they should just stay at Old State U for free and work their butts off to be third stringers because that's how it should be. But I'm cool with the coach making $9 million and doing whatever, you know. So I think it needs to be regulated somehow, and I don't have those answers by any means. But you don't put the toothpaste back in the tube. They're not going to suddenly come out and say, oh, yeah, no, you, you can't sit. You got to sit out now when you transfer again. That's never coming back. A name that was hot a, a few years ago in uh, uh, basketball circles, Greg Marshall. Have you heard anything about what he's doing? This is a question from one of our members. Have you heard anything about what he's doing? Will he ever coach D1 again? Would Mizzou, if we ever had an opening in the future, would Mizzou consider him, in your opinion? I, that one's tough. I mean, in today's culture, and again, think what you want of it, but it's hard to be Bobby Knight and do Bobby Knight type things in today's culture as a coach. Right. And that's kind of what Marshall was, was let go. For. I mean, he was fired at a place where he was crazy successful. They paid the best coach in school history, $7 million to not coach there. That probably indicates it's going to be pretty tough. And now look, Guys might get back in it, but I don't think like this year. I, I think you got to wait longer for Greg Marshall to get another shot. We haven't talked to you uh, since uh, Desiree Reed Francois uh, joined the staff. So Jim asked, what are your first impressions of our new AD? And, and how do you think she will differ from Jim Sturt? Yeah, I, I mean, my first impressions are I like her. She's very personable. Um, a lot of times, especially when you're in the media, people in that position are kind of difficult to just stand and have regular conversations with, right? It's awkward. They know what you do for a living and like, you're not really a real person to them and they're not really a real person to you, but she is, she is very personable, very easy to talk to. I have no idea if that means she's good at her job, right? <laughs> we haven't really seen, I mean, uh, you know, okay. I know she got, uh, she got block seating back and people like that. And she moved the, the visitors out from behind the bench at Fro field and people like that in, in my world, those aren't, huge things that I really care about, but I understand some people do so good for her, but the more substantial things um, we don't really know yet. Right. You got to get a year or two in and, and, uh, and see how she does. I mean, I like her, um, you know, I, I hope she does well. It's good for everybody involved here if she does, but uh, kind of got to wait and see. Okay. You have said you can't really be a, a Mizzou fan anymore because of your job but but that doesn't pertain to your uh, kansas city team so I, I just wanted to see if, if this was impressive 
404 yards passing, five TDs, 29 yards rushing. And oh yeah, those five TD passes came in the span of 11 minutes and 31 seconds. Yeah, he is, that, two, is that good? He played two quarters in that game. Um, and, and so I was joking. And see, the Chiefs are good for me because they do give me a window into remembering how you guys all feel watching Mizzou games because I'm watching Mizzou games and just going, I, I got a ton of stuff to do. It's easier if they win, it's good, but like, I'm not caught up in it. So I'm watching that game and then TJ Watt returns the fumble. And I just texted a bunch of my friends. I'm like, this is how we do it, huh? This is, this is what's going to happen. And so then after the game, I said, they're playing a team with a noodle arm quarterback that can't throw the ball five yards downfield and they get down seven, nothing. And I've been watching this for four years and I still somehow have convinced myself they're going to lose. Like I'm just stupid. I don't learn. Right. So, so I don't know. It's, it's what it is, man, but it's uh, I'll learn eventually maybe, but probably not. Okay. Chiefs bills this, this weekend, what happens? I mean, I, I think, you play 10 times, they probably each win five. I think the Bills are that good. I think the Chiefs aren't quite what they've been, but it's going to come down to like five plays. Um, and it, it, I'll, I'll, I'll take the same rule I've always taken when picking Missouri games where I don't know what's going to happen. It's better for business if I just pick the home team, right? So if, if I'm going, eh, this is a coin toss, I don't know. I just pick Missouri. Well, I don't know what's going to happen, so I just pick what I want to see. So the Chiefs are going to win. And finally, you, you had a lot of ties with, with uh, your dad, Mike, and the, the Royals or, or interest in the Royals or growing up with the Royals and, and Mike covering them. Do um, you have any thoughts on, I, I'm going to say, we, we don't know what the team's going to be here all, but what about downtown baseball? I think that opens a lot of opportunities for development around Arrowhead for the Chiefs and then uh, development downtown and bringing more people, maybe some younger fans of the game. What, what are your thoughts on downtown baseball in Kansas City? So here is how I always assess things. What's good for me? You know what's good for me living in Columbia? Cutting 25 minutes off the drive and literally, like even a Chiefs game, I'm back on I-70 12 minutes after the, the clock hits zero, right? If you, if you find the right way out of that stadium, I'm on I-70 and I'm gone and, and I'm home two hours, two hours and 15 minutes after the game ends. So I kind of like Kaufman, <laughs> but I, I'll be I think baseball's got, lot bigger problems than where the Royals play. I mean, so I, I went full streaming a couple of years ago and between COVID and then the issues they've had with streaming, I haven't watched the Royals game in two years. Um, it was what I grew up loving. It was my favorite sport. Uh, I don't really miss it that much. And, you know, baseball is, if they're losing people my age, they're not even getting kids, my kids age, you know? So um, I think, I think baseball kind of has a uh, crisis on its hands and um, you know, I mean, football so dominates everything now college and pro. I mean, it's so far and above and beyond any other sport. And then frankly, I think the NBA is overtaking baseball. I mean, I don't know what numbers say, but I don't know any 20 year olds who love major league baseball, but I know a lot of 20 year olds that love to watch the NBA. Folks, that's Gabe DeArmond. You can read him at powermazoo.com. He does as good as anybody and does it uniquely covering Mizzou sports, Mizzou recruiting, football, basketball, and you can even read a little bit about softball and everything else on his, his board as well. So, Gabe, thanks as always for your time. We look forward to being back in person and having a Westport yeah. flea market burger with you next year. So thanks for coming in again. Yeah, I'm getting two next time I come up. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Gabe. Next week, everyone, we will have Kathy Nelson, president and CEO of the Kansas City Sports Commission. So she will be our guest at noon next Wednesday on January 25th. Thanks for joining us, everybody, and we will see you all next week. Bye, everybody.